Well, a good morning to you and welcome to Real Talk on this Wednesday morning. I'm Ryan Jesperson, thrilled to be with you. You know what I did, Sam, right out of the gates here. Let me just clarify something. I've just, I have just I raised up my chair because I like the way it was sitting, but you've done such a good job framing up the cameras. I've realized I screwed up my camera frame, didn't I? So watch this. Adjustment on the fly. Let me see if I can swing it. Oh, there we go. That feels better, doesn't it? Do you, do you want to pull back the curtain? Drink even more? <laughs> Is that the drinking? I don't. I don't. I, uh, I don't agree that pull back the curtain is the drinking. Game. You don't. I. I no. I, not this even is, close. This isn't not even, even me. Close. This is. This is coming from the comments. This, this is, is from the real talkers. This is from the real talkers. Yeah. Who are, gotta, who are uh, no doubt all wishing. Who here. are all uh, no doubt wishing morning, each other a everyone. very good morning right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. So what? What was the pull down the curtain moment? Oh, the 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 pull down the curtain moment was going to be. Um, you often adjust your chair when yes. we're on split screen to yes. match your height with to the guests. To match the guests. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, so maybe, do you think the cultural reference, it might be lost on the, the young pups that are tuned in? Uh, and that includes you, Sam, uh, you at, the, at the, the tender young age of 31 years old. Do you, although I feel like you might get this one, the pop culture reference of Max Headroom. Does that resonate with you? It does not. The please, character. please enlighten me. Well, no, I think that we'll leave that to we'll leave okay. that to our listening audience. All right, he, all right. He, Max Headroom was a was a, a, a significant pop culture character uh, in the I'm going to say what late '80s, early '90s, maybe kind of like as as we as we eased into as 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 the digital age was upon us. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when Marty McFly was the biggest film celebrity, Max Headroom was probably one of the biggest pop culture characters. Uh, I have nowhere to go with this because we didn't plan to talk about it. <laughs> But I just felt like I needed a little more headroom in the shot. So there we are. Uh, Coming up in just a moment, we're going to talk to Professor Sylvain Charlebois. I'm very much looking forward to this. This is yet another interview that was suggested slash requested by a Real Talk audience member. Uh, We've been talking about trends in 2020 into trends in 2021 and and, and what they mean for people and and affordability uh, when it comes to, to life is one of the big things that we're talking about. So uh, several of you, I I know probably many of you, uh, took the opportunity to to defer your mortgages when the pandemic was hitting, when a lot of people were losing their livelihood or delaying their livelihood. Those are starting to come up now. So people that deferred their mortgages in, you know, in May, in June, in July, are starting to see those deferrals come up again. We're taking a look at what inflation is doing right now. We're taking a look at what's expected to happen, uh, not just with the cost of groceries in 2020, but into this next year. What are some of the contributing factors? This is the exact type of work that Professor Charlebois does out of Dalhousie University looking to that. Plus, a her worship panel today very much looking forward to right after the nine o'clock news this morning three mayors have agreed to spend some time with us today so we're going to talk to those that are leading councils in saint albert sturgeon county 
and Red Deer, Alberta. As Mayors Kathy Heron, Alana Natchew, and Tara Veer will be joining us for an hour. You're going, but it's not Friday. You're doing a roundtable? We can do roundtables whenever we want. We can do whatever we want, whenever we want, and we're loving that liberating feeling. So we're going to check in with these municipal leaders, these three mayors. We're going to spend an hour talking to them, plus other news of the day. Of course, we kick off the show officially every morning, reminding you that the team at Bitcoin Well is the team that has stepped up right out of the gates as our presenting sponsor, and we're really grateful to have them on board. It's December 23rd. Uh, I don't want to make you panic. But if you don't have your gifts figured out for the holiday season, it is definitely time to hit the panic button. Although I know that we all know that one person, it's probably a guy that every year heads out on December 24th to tick off every item on their list. If that is indeed the case, but you don't want to do all your shopping at a pharmacy, I would suggest that you go swing on by, go check out the team at Bitcoin. Well, reach out to them online. You can find the link under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com and ask them about Bitcoin gift cards. It's the coolest gift. It's the hottest gift this season in stockings across the land. It's the easiest and safest way to buy Bitcoin. What a cool gift this holiday season. All right, let's roll. Real Talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Professor Sylvain Charlebois coming up in just a moment. I love on the, we're watching the comments. We're watching the thread on our live YouTube broadcast. Everybody's saying good morning to each other. Mark in Utah is saying we need more headroom at the top of the frame. I don't think so. I think because if we go further, Mark, that's, that's as low as I can go, but now I feel like I'm kind of... This is like the... What is going on with our coffee maker? It's making more noise now than it's ever made before in its life. Um, this is... Uh, there's there's a lot going on in the studio, it's, it's, right? It's either that or you just didn't have your headphone on on that side. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. I did. It's oh, just okay, making a yeah. lot of noise right now. We did, You know, we, you know we, we could get, though, there's something very relaxing about sitting in a coffee shop, isn't there? Like, when, when all this garbage, when this, this pesky pandemic is through, and we can all go back to things like sitting in coffee shops, there's nothing quite as soothing to me as the sound of a bustling coffee shop while you sit in the corner. I, I say this because, like, I just like sort of like a white noise room to be in anyways. Yeah. But also, you know, as, as a person who's been a freelancer and a creative for the last several years, I love my home office, but... It gets stale after There's a while. There's something about the sound of, of steaming that, yeah. milk, right? The sound of the sound of those espresso shots being pulled. Uh, we're not even intending this, but it but it feels to me to be a perfect segue uh, to welcome in our first guest here this morning. I suspect that he'll be very comfortable with the picture not that quite we're painting. Online Professor yet. Charlebois, not quite with us. Nope, we're okay, uh, just no waiting problem. him to sign. Uh, in. Senior director he is of the Agri Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University. You can find him. Uh, on Twitter at Food Professor, and we're going to be talking about food trends with him. We're also taking a look at, at some of the other stories that are making news today. Sam, do we have that uh, that Facebook post that I just sent to you? Is that ready to go? Could you pull that up on the screen? This is of note. Um, this is of note, everybody. This is pretty interesting. You remember this story out of Calgary we were talking about with that 21? I keep wanting to call. Everyone's calling him a kid. He's not a kid. He's 21. But r- relative to many of us, he's a young He's a young man. Uh, Ocean Weisblatt that was arrested by Calgary police now facing criminal charges for refusing to step off the ODR, right? Refusing to get off the ice. He was on skates. He was playing hockey with his pals. Police said it's time to go. Well, first bylaw said it's time to go. They said, nah. Then the cops said it's time to go. They said, nah. And then it got to the point where it obviously escalated, and we talked to you about that. Well, David Weisblatt is Ocean's uncle. Uh, and this is a pretty interesting public post. You can see he tags his wife, his daughter on this. So th- this is uncle, aunt, and cousin of Ocean Wiseblood who's facing charges. He says a statement regarding the family situation, he says. Now, he's, he's chiming in from Eastern Canada. The family situation out in Calgary. He says Ocean was being fined for not complying with COVID-19 regulations, which resulted in criminal charges of refusing to provide ID and obstructing justice. We do not support his actions toward the two female officers and, the pro- and, and protesting regulations to comply with the laws to get this pandemic under control and flatten the curve. There is a substantial amount of privilege here in that compliance would have resulted in a fine that could be contested in court. Furthermore, 
the choices made subsequent to partner with alt-right news with a history of pseudo-Nazism and oppressing minorities for publicity. He's talking about the rebel. Do not align with our morals or values. We will not be signing any petitions to support this. Lastly, we are disappointed. It has come to us needing to make a public statement about our family. Please stay safe. That from David, Janine, and Kayla. So that's from the uncle of Ocean Wisebud. I think that's pretty interesting. It's also in this day and age that we have to double check everything and make sure that it's legit. I was like, that looks like something that could be easily photoshopped if somebody wanted to undermine the wise splats argument here. But there you have it. His uncle, we've obviously double checked. We it. did a very fast fact check. Right we did a very we fast fact air. check, which meant that I went on his Facebook and and and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I audited his Facebook page to make sure that it goes back in time. It wasn't but just most created people call that using creeping. photos that are ripped off of other Facebook profile accounts. So there you have it. So the Weisblatt family. And it, and, and, and it alludes to something, Sam, too, which I thought was interesting, where he says it's, uh, it's kind of sad that it's got to the point where we had to make a public statement, which indicates to me that the entire family, that people bearing that surname, are probably being subjected to some criticism regardless of the fact whether or not they're in Alberta. I mean, that's what it kind of says to me. Yeah, that's that's sort of what it looks like. And and I don't want to say that's justified. I don't want to say, I mean, there's people in my family that, you know, there's... Actually, I can't really name somebody in my family now that I think about it that I, I want to be distanced from. But, you, like, you were, I get you it. You were considering going on the air and naming a family member you want to be distanced from? No, that's just it. It's like, I wasn't going to name names. I was just thinking, <laughs> it's like, is there a person that bears the name Brooks out there? I mean, also, it's a common surname. Um... Uh, most Brookses in Canada are not related to Why me. are we making this about you? I, this is about my, the Wise Blast. Yes, and my point was going to be, um, it must suck to have the same ner- surname as this idiot in Calgary and yeah. then suddenly just be subjected to all the all the same <laughs> criticism that he is. That was my point. Yeah, okay. Okay, so David, I, it took me a while to get yeah. there. Well, you got there. Yeah. Uh, you let me know when Professor Charlebo is ready to go, and we're going to jump into it. Nothing so far. Okay, well, well what I want to do then is take an opportunity to get into some of the other things that we may have had on the back burner otherwise. Uh, why don't we take a look and check in with what uh, Mr. Cynic says. Ryan, you have a bottle of something on your desk. What do you drink? A bottle on my desk? No, I don't. I What's he talking I think it's your Pellegrino why don't over we there, take, actually. Yeah, you want, to, you want to take camera four and we can audit the desk? What do we have? I don't think... No, there's nothing really... In, there should be a bottle on the desk, right? There should be a bottle. It's December 23rd. It, it, yeah. I, it, and there also... I mean, there's there are bottles lined up literally right out of view of that camera on the windowsill. Yeah, there are there are there are a few bottles on the uh on Yeah, no, like I said, I think that I think that bottle of Pellegrino is what he's talking about there. Yeah, okay. Um let's get to some emails. Uh I wanted I wanted to remind you all that you can uh, and let me know when Sylvan's ready to go, but you can anytime be in touch with the show at talk at ryanjesperson.com. So you know, you can you can send us messages on the live YouTube thread. You can send us messages on Twitter at Real Talk RJ, but but often those kind of get lost in the mix. There's a lot going on in the morning. If you send an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com, it ensures that it's gonna land in my inbox, in Sam's inbox. We're gonna review it. And it's something that, you know, we may not respond to in the first five minutes. But it's something that certainly uh, we're going to add to the list of, of, of segments we're considering, of perspectives that we're enlightening ourselves with. We really appreciate everybody that takes the time to be in touch, which includes Chris B. Uh, Chris wrote into the show. This was after I was talking about we were talking about race issues last week. And I told you about this Netflix, uh, this miniseries called Surgeon's Cut. I think that's what it's called. Surgeon's Cut that I watched. And, and there was that uh, the neurosurgeon from the Mayo Clinic that uh, was in, uh, that had immigrated uh, from Mexico as, as a young man, had schooled himself in the United States and had, had risen to this position of great esteem. And he was talking about how one of his professors had said to him, can you imagine this, uh, said, where are you from? And uh, he, he said, I'm from Mexico. And the professor says, there's no way, you're way too smart to be from Mexico. And he, he, he was just like, if you've seen the episode, you know what I'm talking about. You can see it on his face as, as he tells the story like 20 years later. He's just like, what? The? You can tell that it motivated him and fueled him. So we're talking about this. Regardless, it prompted Chris B, Chris B to reach out to us. And, and he says, I was listening to your show today. He says, loving it. He says, it was during that segment with Dr. Mana Saleh that you referenced that Netflix documentary you're watching called Surgeon's Cut. Uh, episode two, the one you watched with the neurosurgeon. He says, I hadn't even heard of this documentary series. My, so my wife and I decided to check it out. He says, again, I want to say 
I'm loving Real Talk because you pass things along like that Netflix series without even knowing it. I would say another example, Sam, might, might be the Hanson salted caramel coffee creamer that we mentioned that subsequently sold out in Edmonton 24 hours later. We're talking about things we have no idea the type of impact it's going to have. So Chris goes on to say, uh, this particular episode that we ended up watching really moved me, the episode of Surgeon's Cut, and I wanted to share why. And so I'm reading this. I was reading it yesterday over a coffee, and I thought, the audience is going to love this. He says, I, I found that neurosurgeon... Uh, Dr. Alfredo Quinonez Hinosa, one of the most caring and compassionate physicians I've ever seen. He reminded me so much of a pediatric neurosurgeon that we had in our own backyard at the Stollery. Dr. Keith Aronic, who had an experience uh, way back about 20 years ago, along with pediatric neurologist Dr. Barry Sinclair. Chris says in September 2000, it's story time, kids, so come on. He says in September 2000, our oldest daughter was born with an extremely rare genetic disorder called a Cardi syndrome, along with many disabilities, physical and mental. She's also blind. But one of the hardest things for us to grasp was a severe seizure disorder. Her seizures at one time were so bad, it was like a blip on a record. She was having them every two minutes. Chris says, my wife and daughter basically moved into the Stollery Hospital in December of 2000. So we're talking 20 years ago with the neurology staff just trying to figure out what to do. Dr. Sinclair knew where the seizures were coming from. They were coming from the the front right lobe of her brain. And between him and Dr. Aronic, they knew what they had to do to save my daughter's life. It's called a front right cortical resection. Can you imagine if this is your kid that they're talking about? like significant brain surgery. I don't even know what a front right cortical resection is, but it sounds pretty deadly serious. He says, both doctors sat with us to discuss our options and what they wanted to do as the best plan of attack. With our okay, they had to go in front of 26 different hospital staff and administrators and convince them to perform brain surgery on my four and a half month old daughter to save her life. It took 12 hours to complete. So in February of 2001, we were informed that Dr. Aronic would be performing this front lobe cortical resection of the front right half of my daughter's brain with Dr. Sinclair mapping out her brain. He says, I tell you, Ryan, that dealing with these two doctors was an experience I will never forget. While watching surgeons cut that show, he says, a rush of memories came flooding back to me. But the part that I remember the most was sitting with my daughter before she went into surgery, Dr. Aronic coming in to reassure me that everything was going to be okay. He and this doctor featured on Netflix are cut from the same cloth. I feel so helpless knowing that I may never, I felt so helpless knowing that I may never hold my daughter again, but I had faith. I had to in this caring and compassionate man. It will be 20 years this February, says Chris, that Dr. Aronic and Dr. Sinclair saved my daughter's life. And even though she's still is dealing with the the odd seizure here and there. Not a day goes by that I'm not so incredibly grateful to be living in Edmonton, having the Stollery Hospital in our very own backyard. That from Chris B., who tunes in and joins us every single day. And Chris, we so appreciate you taking the time to send us that email. What a reminder of how blessed we are. Not just, I mean, he's describing his daughter, the seizures that she has, the blindness she deals with, all of those challenges. Let's count our blessings today, but also to have the Stollery Children's Hospital here. Absolutely amazing. We're going to get to Dr. Sylvain Charlebois in just a moment. Wanted to remind you that this show happens because of the support of amazing partners like the six locations of Dairy Queen in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. And today, tomorrow, and Christmas Day, their Christmas frozen ice cream logs are on half price for you. The Real Talk audience. That's right. If you're close to Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, Y Gardens, or Baseline Road, pop on in, mention Real Talk, and you're going to get one of those legendary ice cream logs for 50% off. It's their Christmas gift to you for being a part of this listening and viewing community. Our huge thanks to them. And I know that this embarrasses them. I know that this makes them a little self-conscious. They get a little meek. These guys donate so much cash to charity. I've been involved with some of the nonprofits that they've been funding. Buy in confidence, knowing that these community 
corporate citizens are doing exactly what we would ask of them, especially during this holiday season. Amazing support from the team at DQ. Let's get to our leadoff guest this morning. We've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. He's an expert in issues around food. As a matter of fact, his Twitter handle is Food professor out at Dalhousie University. He's senior director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab. It's a real pleasure to welcome to the show Dr. Sylvain Charlebois. Dr. Charlebois, thanks for making time for us today. Well, thank you, Ryan, for having me. This is a, a, a fascinating area of study for you, I would imagine, because you're paying attention to so many different contributing factors as you monitor food trends. And of course, it's relevant to every single person on planet earth so i would imagine every time you talk you have a captive audience a, a little uh, i've been doing this for 20 years and uh and i have a great relationship with media uh, without media of course we wouldn't have that that connection with with the audience with the public uh we've been busy this year we uh, we actually release a lot of different reports on on food food trends what's going on uh across uh, across the spectrum, uh, I mean, we're we're always dealing with uh, with the entire food system, um, looking at both ends of the food continuum, essentially from farm gate to to plate, uh, which is why we really really were busy this year in 2020 because a lot of people were wondering what is going on with our food system. Are we going to run out of food, and if so, why? If not, what's next? So those are the questions we we received the most often this year anyways yeah well and and what a year it's been as we evaluate i mean many people for example that have been talking about supply chain uh would not have had something like supply chain on their radar had we not been taking a look at the impact of this pandemic etc as you look back on 2020 i will note that we're not through the pandemic yet uh, but we've had nine months to evaluate its impact what sort of an impact has it had on canada's uh why don't we start with food supply and i'll let you take it from there yeah, I mean, it's uh, of course, uh, 2020 was a significant year. Uh, we, uh, I mean, the we every year we actually go through our top 10 food stories of the year. The number one uh, story uh, we felt as a group was the panic buying phenomena we saw in March and April, and that was due to essentially due to the unknown that we were all facing about the virus, about how public health officials would be dealing with the virus. A lot of people actually went to the grocery store without knowing when they would be allowed to go back <laughs> again. That's why we saw a lot of panic buying. And of course, when people saw empty shelves, they wondered, my goodness, how can this happen in Canada? one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And so a lot of people, you know, for many years, people wanted to know where their food came from, what's in their food. They wanted more food supply chain transparency. But this year it was more about how it actually works or doesn't work. And so really the narrative completely shifted. And, and that's why a lot of governments, including Alberta's, by the way, are looking into food autonomy, how to grow more food all year round so we can become more uh, autonomous, I would say. What uh, what is most what would you say is the biggest contributing factor to having an autonomous food supply? Uh, if you want if you want to talk, first of all, you want to talk about the province of Alberta. We could talk about what we do well and then we could talk about some of the challenges that would impact food supply. I would say, for example, climate, where we'd have to have perhaps more robust greenhouse or, or those types of setups if we wanted to have fresh produce, as an example. If we were talking nationally, perhaps we'd be better equipped. But what would have to happen here uh, socially, from a government support standpoint, from an industry trend standpoint for that to happen? I would say I mean, we've had talks with the Department of Agriculture in Alberta for for the last little while, and I can, I can feel certainly that uh, there is – more t attention given to food systems in in the province. Uh, of course, there's uh, the, the the what's going on with the oil sector is really prompting the government to think uh, think about other sectors to grow the economy. And uh, and the and to me, the automatic pick for uh, a sector which can grow even more is agri-food in, in Alberta. And of course, Alberta is very good at farm gate uh, economics with, uh, with the cattle industry, but we did see some, some major disruptions with, uh, with High River, for example, seeing how con concentration, uh, concentrated 
and consolidated the, the sector actually is and essentially it's quite vulnerable so there's some work to do on processing but there's there's tremendous opportunities for for albertans to do very well in agri-food uh, when i think about dairy for example and uh, and poultry and and with pulses and um, i mean there's the super cluster proteins industries canada which is based out of saskatchewan but it also covers alberta and there's lots of things that, that Albertans can do to grow the agri-food economy. And, and I suspect coming out of COVID, uh, there's going to be more attention given to that sector. Professor, we've, we've been talking uh, about, I mean, we talked to the federal environment minister a few days ago. We, we read a very compelling letter from a farmer uh, that talked about the impact of the carbon tax on his input costs and on his bottom oh, line. Oh, my goodness, yeah. Right? I mean, geez. I, a I real well, worry for... Well, no I mean, kidding. I, 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 sh- I feel for farmers because I, I honestly... I've been told by farmers, especially a lot of them in Alberta, saying, well, the carbon tax is impacting food prices. The answer is likely, but we don't have any evidence. But at $170 a metric ton, it's impossible uh, not to see how a carbon tax could impact food affordability in this country eventually. It's a hefty tax. And so obviously I share – um, our farmers concerned about the carbon tax. Absolutely. Yeah. So you uh, and, and your, your colleagues at the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University, I see, have forecasted that you're expecting the cost of food. Let's say I might be oversimplifying to say the price of groceries. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the price of groceries expected to rise by about 5 percent, which would outpace inflation, of course, for the average family. That means about 700 bucks more next year as opposed to 2020. Um, what contributes to that rise? Well, uh, this is our 11th edition uh, of Canada's Food Price Report. Every year, typically, would, we would see one or f- two food categories driving food inflation. This year, uh, we're, we're looking at three, meat, a bakery, and vegetables. And, and all three will have a different story. Meat, um, the meat trifecta was heavily affected by, by COVID. So chicken, pork, and, and beef, uh Normally, you would probably see one component of the meat trifecta being affected by food inflation. This year was all three. We are expecting that uh, that momentum to continue into two, two, uh, 2021. Bakery, uh, it's a cyclical thing. Uh, bakery is due to increase, and we see it in our models. Uh, bakery bread actually did increase in 2008, 2009, it, and it was just a matter of time. And finally, with vegetables, California is the big story there. Uh, importers will have to look elsewhere. And we're already seeing it in, in grocery stores right now. You're seeing uh, produce from Peru and, and Latin America much more so than, than past years, just because California is kind of off the table as a result of wildfires and mm-hmm. climate change, which affected crops. It, not necessarily fires, but the smoke was so intense this year. It really affected uh, California's ability to feed other uh, other markets, essentially. Uh, Professor, I got a, a listener here, Heather, that that says on our live comments on YouTube, she says, "Eat less meat. That will keep your bills down and help the environment." Uh, you and your colleagues, <laughs> have, she, you know where I'm going with this. You've you've yeah. determined incredible statistics based on polling uh, that show that how Canadians consume meat protein um, very quickly. Uh, in British Columbia, about 56 percent of British Columbians say that they eat meat daily. About 57 percent of Ontarians eat meat daily 48 percent of quebecers and 55 percent of those in atlantic canada compared to alberta where 71 percent of us eat meat on a daily basis is it a cultural issue here and what do you make of that uh i mean it's not just alberta i mean canadians are still committed to animal proteins yeah Uh, but what's really wonderful about vegetable proteins is that we're providing consumers with more choice uh it doesn't necessarily mean you'll save money by the way uh because uh some some products out there are pretty darn expensive and but we are we are expecting uh vegetable proteins to become cheaper in years to come because there's more competition that market is worth now in canada 300 million dollars and it's it's grown by 31 percent this year alone it could reach a billion dollars by 2025 so a lot of people are actually interested in vegetable proteins but it doesn't mean that you'll save money now but by 2025 i suspect that vegetable proteins will get much much cheaper dr sylvain charlebois our guest out of dalhousie university the agri-food analytics lab you, you do the top 10 food stories of the year what was another 
big one that you think should be on Canadians' radar? Well, of course, the, the restaurant uh, industry it was uh, hugely impacted this year. I think we did talk a lot about how restaurants were resilient. Uh, we're probably going to lose 25 to 3 percent of restaurants in this country uh, by the time we're done with the pandemic. But these people are resilient. They're, they're going to come back and they're going to come back with new products, new menus, new designs. Uh, so it, there's, it's not all bad, but it was really a big story for us this year. E-commerce is a big one. The number of people buying food online is insane, uh, insane. The, the, the business is triple. If you're out there selling food to consumers, go online and there's a market. Uh, there's probably eight to $10 billion worth of food sold online in Canada now. If you're a farmer, a processor, it doesn't matter who you are, you have a shot at connecting with consumers looking for food. Uh, let me ask you this in closing, Professor. Your research shows that about 30%, this is really, I, I need you to make sense of this for me. About 30% of people surveyed in Canada say that they, they're, they're, they do not intend to eat healthier next year. What does that mean? Are, we, are three in 10 of us throwing in the towel? I, that was a weird one for me. Uh, actually, I, I thought that. You know, given we've been talking about the COVID-15, yeah. COVID-15 pounds and the pandemic pounds, and uh, I thought people would actually care more about their own health. Uh, there's a bit of a paradox because on the one hand, people want to eat more vegetables and fruits in the new year. A lot of them, a lot of Canadians, at uh, 60%. On the other hand, people actually don't necessarily want to follow a diet, actually, because we did survey the same Canadians compared to last year. So we surveyed Canadians last year and this year compared 20% fewer Canadians intend to follow a diet in 2021. So I think people are just saying, let's go through this. Let's get through this and then start caring about our own weight and our own health later. Yeah, I think that's what's going on. We may not have dietitians and personal trainers agreeing with us, but I can certainly understand the logic. <laughs> hey, doctor, we know that this is a busy time of year. Everybody, every news outlet in Canada seems to want to talk to you. We really appreciate your availability, and, and we wish you and your family a very happy holidays and a Merry Christmas. Well, Merry Christmas to you, Ryan. Thank you. You got it. That's Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, uh, a senior director and a professor at the Agri-Food Analytics Lab. They do amazing work. As he mentioned, for more than a decade, uh, they've tracked the top food trends in the country. You can uh, That's out of Dalhousie University. Uh, you can learn more by following him on Twitter, at Food Professor. And, of course, they're behind Canada's Food Price Report as well. They just released their 11th edition uh, for 2021, which shows, again, about a 5% increase expected in the cost of groceries for the average Canadian family, about 700 bucks. We're grateful that we can do interviews like this, thanks to the team at Westworld Computers that keep this show up and running on the air each and every day with our lineup uh, through the Mac lineup, the PowerBook and the iMac and the iPad and the iPhones and everything else, you'll find them at Westworld Computers. They've been in the business, an independent family-owned business for more than 40 years in Western Canada, including our home city of Edmonton, my birth city of Calgary, and my school of post-secondary education out in Vancouver. As a matter of fact, I bought my first ever personal computer one of those orange iMacs with the orange printer, the orange mouse, the orange keyboard, and everything else. Remember those back in the day at Westworld in Vancouver? I'm proud to have had a long personal relationship with them, and we're proud to have them on board here at Real Talk. We're also very grateful to have Park Power powering our Real Talk RJ hashtag. That's how you can reach us on Twitter. We'll be checking in with the hashtag momentarily. Here's the thing. The team at Park Power has just made it even more appealing for you to bring your natural gas, electricity, and internet business over to them. Aside from the fact that they're locally owned and operated, they employ local people, and they give back to local nonprofits as part of their profit sharing, they now have a promo code for Real Talk audience members that bring your business over. When you sign up as a home or a business with Park Power and enter the promo code 2021 dash real talk 2021 dash real talk you'll receive 70 dollars off your first bill 70 bucks no strings attached at parkpower.ca you can of course link to them as well under the sponsors tab at ryan jesperson.com sam let's take a look at the headlines before we get into it with three of alberta's mayors
Well, we can see right now, as a matter of fact, updating this live, that Health Canada has just approved the Moderna vaccine uh, for use in Canada. That means that the Pfizer, BioNX, and Moderna vaccines will now be, uh, they've received that stamp of approval and ready to be deployed here in Canada. Meantime, changes to Alberta's COVID protocols, temporary changes announced by Premier Kenny yesterday. Uh, people who live alone will now be allowed to attend one event at another household over the long Christmas weekend. That runs from yesterday until December 28th. The Premier says this was adopted from advice from Health Minister Dr. Dina Hinshaw with input uh, by that COVID cabinet committee. Uh, it was read in a statement by Dr. Dina Hinshaw yesterday, says that the approach strives to balance mental wellness for individuals living alone and the need to limit the spread. Keep in mind, this is just after a Calgary court struck down John Carpe's move with the Constitutional Justice Freedoms Movement, remember, to declare these rulings, the, the, these mandates as, as unconstitutional. The court said no. And then the government announced these changes. Is that on anybody's radar? I know that this is supposed to be the news time, not the wax poetic time, but doesn't it sort of seem strange? Do you find it hard to believe that Dr. Dina Hinshaw would approve lifting restrictions around the holidays to allow people to mingle after talking about how important it was we don't mingle? I don't know. This is where my brain's at on this one. Seems weird. Seems fishy. I know some people are going to be grateful. You're going to write in right now. You're going to say, I'm all by myself at Christmas. Why shouldn't I be able to see my parents? Why shouldn't I be able to see my kids? And the discussion goes on. The government also announcing that more than 287,000 Albertans are now using the Alberta Trace Together app. They say 22 new users are registering every hour. What was not reported, which makes it interesting, is that the government had recently ordered that Alberta Trace Together app to be downloaded by all Government of Alberta and Alberta Health Services employees. I suspect that that may be behind that jump. And also... President Donald Trump, now nearing the home stretch of his one term in office, has pardoned 15 people, including former GOP lawmakers and four of those Blackwater guards, you know, the private security firm, the guards that had been implicated in killings in Iraq. Those pardons handed out. All right, let's get into this. I'm uh, eager to see where our next three guests are going to take this next hour here on Real Talk. Oh, Mayor Veer's already with us. This is fantastic. She was on a call, which means she must have just got on the line with us. It is a pleasure for me to welcome to you. Uh, here's the deal. We're going to go on the screen as you're seeing it at home. So right next to me, uh, she's the mayor of Sturgeon County, Her Worship Mayor Alana Natchew. Welcome to Real Talk, and thanks for making time for us today. Thank you for the invitation and congratulations on the amazing show. Thank you. Next to you on the screen, as people are seeing this, watching live on YouTube, is the mayor of St. Albert, Her Worship, Kathy Heron. Mayor, welcome to the show. Good morning, Ryan. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for this opportunity and sorry about the weird text I gave you two days ago. What was the weird <laughs> text? led to this. What was the weird about text you, you gave me? Because oh. you called you called out Mayor Blake and Mayor Veer, and you forgot some other good female mayors. <laughs> he did. I did. That's I true. Season, yeah. That's true. So the background here, uh, before we officially welcome Mayor Veer to the program, is so So I was talking to Stephen Carter, a political strategist, and we talked about whether or not Calgary's going to elect a female mayor. And, and, and in his understanding, he believes that Calgarians are more motivated now than ever before uh, to, to, to elect a, a, a mayor who is a woman. And we started talking about mayors in Alberta. And female mayors in Alberta and you're right off the top of my head I started naming them and and I skipped over St. Albert not as a shun not as a diss there was just a lot going on between my ears and uh and I forgot a few and and one of them uh, you Mayor Heron was quick to text me and, and let me know that I was in, in to be fair water. I don't think I could just list Alberta mayors off the top of my head well like, but that is that my, is a unique ability that you it, have it's kind of my job though so so Mayor Heron you have my official apology and, and there's not that many women. We have to also shout out to Mayor Gail Catcher in Fort Saskatchewan as well. Absolutely. Uh, Mayor Karen yeah. Sorensen in Banff also uh, should deserve yeah. to mention. Uh, let's officially bring Mayor Veer into the conversation. She's the mayor of Red Deer, uh, of course. And uh, and, and as, as far as, I mean, I, we haven't been able to determine quite yet, Mayor Veer, uh, whether or not you're seeking re-election. I know that this is a fastball right out of the gates, high and inside, but as we're trying to track what's going on in different Alberta communities, you have not made that announcement yet, correct? Have you? No, I'm a firm uh, believer in serving out your mandate and then making your announcement. 
Um, I think particularly, and I, I've lived by that uh, the last few elections, uh, but I think particularly in this time, uh, the people in my community need me to govern. Uh, there's a time for vote seeking, uh, and I personally very strongly feel that this this isn't the time for that. Um, I, I certainly respect uh, that my colleagues are around the province are are making their declarations, uh, but I've personally uh, just made the choice that I need to govern. Uh, I'm doing my inventory right now. I always uh, go through my list. What did I promise? Have I fulfilled my promises? And what would I like to do? Uh, and then I'll make my official declaration in probably in the summer. You know, I think that something like that is really going to resonate with voters uh, to think that a, 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 an elected official that sought office by making promises is actually tracking the promises they made and trying to determine whether or not they've made meaningful progress on those. We don't always see that from elected officials. Mayor Natchew, how do you how do you approach that process of, of, of governing, uh, but also at the same time, quite frankly, you know, trying to determine what's best for your political future, for your personal life? How do you find that balance? Uh, I have to agree agree with uh, with Mayor Veer, and the question has come up uh, around here lately as well. And I just have to say that uh, I've approached this job with uh, 110% of myself and, and quite a lot of percentage of my family uh, brought into this as well, because this really is uh, quite an all-consuming position. And so I haven't really taken the time to think about uh, the next election, uh, other than making sure that I'm committed to, uh, as, as Mayor Veer said, uh, governing and facing the, the challenges of today, because I'm pretty sure when all of us ran in 2017, when we were thinking about what the next four years held for us and for our communities, we didn't see uh, another, you know, uh, the bottom falling out of the oil market and, and a global pandemic, uh, among other things. So uh, really, I haven't got into uh, thinking about it other than I love the job. Uh, I love the opportunity in Sturgeon County and in the Edmonton region. Um, I see there's uh, certainly a need across this province and across this country for highly engaged, uh, logical, solution-oriented um, leaders. And, and that is uh, what I consider myself and obviously Mayor Heron, who I have the opportunity to work with uh, more closely. So uh, there's a great team of us here with boots on the ground trying to do the right thing. and. Um, and it would be great if there was a few familiar faces returning after the next election, because it's kind of like every four years you hit this reset button uh, and you spend, you know, for the new people on, like I was in 2017, you spend the first few months just figuring out where the light switches are yeah. and, and who does what. So, um, have, you know, love the job and, and just trying to get through. And, and I'm enjoying my second day of Christmas holidays, a uh, much needed break. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll make my decision uh, in the new year, but but so far I'm loving it and feel there's a lot of opportunity to continue to pour into my community. So you're, you're, you're just into your holiday break after a hell of a year and in comes the interview request from Real Talk that gets you to wake up early again and and uh, yeah, well, we appreciate your availability. I, I'd like to encourage all three of you to, to feel free to interact with one another, jump in, uh, add to each other's comments. Please treat this like we're friends out for coffee as opposed to an official formal interview. Uh, Mayor Heron, let me let me go to you on this, but I encourage all three of you to chime in. All three of you uh, are, are leading councils and are leading government in communities where the energy industry uh, has a huge footprint. Now, in different contexts, uh, Red Deer looks a little different than, than Sturgeon County. Sturgeon County, a little bit different than the city of St. Albert. Albert, obviously, uh, but Mayor Heron, economically speaking, and, and, and in other contexts of governance, what has 2020 been like for you, specifically with the <laughs> pandemic? There's kind of the two, the double whammy we talk about that everybody talks about, which is the pandemic and then obviously the collapse of oil prices globally, and it's and it's really put the economy through a ringer. What has that meant uh, to, to your governance in St. Albert? I don't think St. Albert's any different in in some of the, the basic type, commercial type economics, um, restaurants are suffering or small businesses are suffering. Um, you know, the positive that has come out of this is a, a resurgence in focus on our local uh, employers and businesses, which is great to see. I, the campaigns that we have um, tried in the past sometimes fell on deaf ears, but the pandemic has uh, opened ears and people are really shopping locally and it's fun to see. So that that is is a concern in how we uh, treat our local businesses. But at the same time, um, the provincial government has provided uh, some 
capital money that St. Albert specifically has invested into jobs. Essentially, we, we're doing uh, road work um, to help transportation corridors. We're doing servicing infrastructure to open up new lands. So I think I always try to look at the opportunities in, in, a, in a negative and, and some of that uh, stimulus money has really helped St. Albert. And even before the pandemic, we, we were twinning a major road in St. Albert, which is called Ray Gibbon Drive. And uh, as soon as we had a government partnership on that road. We had a major investment from a big logistic company, Uline. It's going to be our biggest employer, biggest taxpayer, 300 some odd jobs. It's it's fantastic. So there's still a lot of interest, I think, in the Edmonton metropolitan region for investment. Mayor Veer, it's uh, Red Deer for a lot of years, especially through the boom. We saw Red Deer's, I mean, I'm talking mid-2000s, saw Red Deer's population explode. Obviously, there was I was living there at the time. I saw it. I told those stories as a journalist in Red Deer at the time. What has the slowdown, the, the double whammy, so to speak, done to, to Red Deer? And then, and then, of course, surrounding area. We'll note that the, the population of Red Deer, correct me if I'm wrong, about 80,000, but, but central Alberta, I mean, within 45 minutes of Red Deer, you've got, what, probably 400,000 people. <laughs> Yeah, so our our Red Deer proper populations uh, just over 100,000, just 101,000, and the region that we serve is about 400, 450,000. Uh, our local and regional economy is very much an oil and gas economy. Uh, although I will say, and 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 therefore very much subject uh, to the ebbs and flows of an oil and gas uh, economy. And if if you look statistically, just even in terms of unemployment, where Red Deer's been at the last five years uh, in particular, uh, it's been substantial. Uh, although I will I will say this: I think we have made a, an intentional effort to pivot. Uh, and to diversify our, our local economy. You know, as Albertans, we talk about diversifica diversification a lot, uh, but I will say that we've made an intentional effort. Uh, you know, first and foremost, we've positioned ourselves as a regional hub community and have attracted infrastructure investment um, to fulfill that role as a regional hub uh, community. And we've seen an economy develop around that. Um, critical projects such as, uh, you know, Red Deer College becoming Red Deer University will not only keep population in Red Deer, will attract it. Um, th sort of the second area that we've focused on and, and concur with Mayor Heron on this is with respect to the infrastructure stimulus uh, that's come through federally and provincially uh, as a result of the pandemic. We have had some long-awaited infrastructure projects uh, that, that were showing on our 10-year capital plan, but that we've been able to follow through on those. Uh, and it is, e even though uh, certainly there's a lot of unemployment in the community, it is heartening to see cranes in downtown Red Deer and to see uh, construction crews out and about in the community. And I, I think the final area that we've focused on is in terms of being uh, business friendly. Uh, we needed to take some inventory at City Hall uh, in terms of how business friendly we were. Uh, and I think that we've used the pandemic as a catalyst to pivot there uh, and have taken, taken advantage, I, I think, of, of some of the uh, legislation, which we had some reluctance with uh, earlier in the year, uh, but have taken advantage of that since that time. Uh, and we've, we are changing our local economy repositioned ourselves uh, as a destination for sports tourism, uh, as an example, uh, and have some incentives for downtown redevelopment. Mayor so, Veer, let me ask you, do you, do you face, uh, having lived in Red Deer, I know how proud uh, people in Red Deer and, and, and Sylvan and Eckville and Black Falls and all these wonderful communities, how proud they are of, of their work in uh, traditional energy, in, in oil and gas. Um, and I've also had many conversations with buddies down there, hockey buddies, about diversifying the economy. And, and I wouldn't say maybe more so than anywhere else, but certainly prominently in Red Deer, there's been, uh, from my friends anyway, uh, cynicism around diversifying the economy, uh, even in their own wheelhouses, even with their own careers. Uh, you know, what am I supposed to do? I've been doing this for 20 years. Are you telling me I'm supposed to pivot like this? How do you as an elected official communicate that message that not only is it possible, but it's it's very important? I, I think I, I would agree with you. I think that we've been in a transition process and sometimes change takes time. Um, and we weren't going to diversify overnight. And, and I do think that there is cynicism because as Albertans, we talk about diversification so much, but we don't always necessarily follow through um, to the extent that we need to. 
But diversification doesn't necessarily doesn't mean we have that we're abandoning our oil and gas economy. We're very proud of our oil and gas uh, economy. We're proud supporters uh, and advocate uh, for pipeline infrastructure to the federal uh, government. Um, we're proud of Canadian energy, um, and and you know. I, I think there, there's lots of local companies that look at new technologies in, in order to um, for sustainable Canadian energy as well. Um, I, I think that there is fear though when when there a, a community identity or or one's personal identity uh, has been in the in the energy industry in the in the historic sense, and so I I think that until we actually see results of our diversification, uh, there will be uncertainty. And I think that that's very natural for people. And I think we have to respect that. Um, I'll, I'll use the Justice Exe Center for an example. Red Deer's fought for a decade to get a new Justice Center. And that's one project. And that's not that was a justice project, but not an economic diversification project. But uh, the, the drawing renderings were just released publicly uh, last night. And when you see what that will do for our downtown in terms of transforming our downtown, that's one very small piece of the puzzle, but that one project will really change our community's DNA downtown. But until we actually see the jobs from that initiative in 2023, uh, there, there, I think there will continue to be that cynicism and fear. And I, and I fully respect that households and businesses uh, are suffering and it's difficult as a as a local leader to talk about diversification in principles when you've got uh, someone who's fearful uh, for their livelihoods um, and to translate sort of those broader principles into something that's personal until it actually translates into jobs for Red Deerians and Central Albertans. Mayor Nachu, you're this is this is like right in front of you. I mean, all three of you obviously this is relevant. What Mayor Veer's talking about, but I'll note that you're the current chair of the Alberta Industrial Heartland Association. Uh, you're also the jurisdictional lead on the Alberta Heartland Hydrogen Task Force. Did, is it a stretch, or, or or is this an obvious segue into talking about hydrogen? Uh, I think diversification is is a perfect segue to talk about about hydrogen and that's just one of the areas where we're diversifying. I mean the heartland itself is diversification because you're you're taking that fossil fuel and moving it through the pet chem uh, value chain turning it into plastics and fertilizer and and refining bitumen and a number of things. So so that's one area of diversification. Uh, we're also diversifying and, and Kathy and I are working together on the Villeneuve Landing Network. Sturgeon County is working sub-regionally to uh, develop the uh, Edmonton Airport, uh, regional airport out in Villeneuve and uh, going after some aviation, aerospace and potentially uh, defense in the future. Um, and yeah, hyd hydrogen is a part of that. There's, there's uh, you know, Bill Gates is investing in hydrogen uh, airplanes. Uh, there's uh, CPs investing in hydrogen, um, uh, you know, trains. Uh, so, and again, Fort Saskatchewan has uh, is going to be doing a ATCO is going to be doing a blend of hydrogen and natural gas for home heating. So, you know, the the task force is complete, and now we're rolling out the node. And I think, you know, which which to remove fear from people, they need to see themselves reflected in the future. And, and we do that by not stranding the assets that we already have here, whether it's infrastructure and pipeline or a labor force, that human capital. And, and so, you know, people get in this discussion as to whether it's blue hydrogen or green hydrogen and, and, and whether or not you should be using hydrogen made from fossil fuels. But I think we need to here because we have the skill set, we have the assets, and, and we need to be able to provide cleaner energy and appropriately support uh, you know, changing or upgrading the skills of the people who need the jobs and working with the post-secondary institutions to be able to, to uh, roll that out in a logical way and, and for there to be just constant improvement from industry investing in technology, you know, not just expecting handouts. Uh, and I have to say these handouts you know, aren't necessarily, they're, they're not handouts. They're, they're subsidies often to be able to support and signal that governments are interested in a transition. So, so we need to, you know, take certain steps by changing regulation or creating regulation, creating safety codes, uh, working with uh, labor force, academia, subject matter experts, and 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 people writing policy at all levels of government to be able to initiate this kind of change that's needed. 
And, and I don't want to get caught up in the conversation around whether or not climate change is real. I'm telling you the investment climate change is real. And that's what we need to respond to. Um, people are looking at higher standards of environmental, social and, and governance responsibility uh, for their investments around the world. And at the, uh, the Heartland Association, uh, that's a big part of our, our strategic plan. Uh, and the shift to hydrogen is is being rolled into that. So, I mean, we, we saw the clean fuel standard coming. We've known that's been in the work uh, for a couple of years. There's also um, particulate matter uh, changes coming as far as air shed monitoring. So, I mean, these are the spaces that we live in and love and, and um, we need to be able to use the resources that are here as responsibly as possible and constantly strive to, to get better. And, and so, that's that's what we're doing. And then as your your guest uh, previously talking about plant protein, you know, the opportunity for protein fractionation here again is is a is an incredible opportunity. Uh, the same thing that we do with fossil fuels in the heartland, adding value to a commodity is the same thing that we can do in the egg sector, adding value to the product here instead of just um, shipping out our raw resources and buying them back for more money later. It's it's an insane approach. And that's got to change. Yeah. And that's what we're yeah, I think if more people called it straight like you just did, an insane approach, maybe it would get more people's attention. Maybe we'd, we'd make a bit more of an impact there. I know that's resonating with Mayor Veer there. I want to I want to just tell you right now, Mayor Nacho, I'm stealing that line from you. Uh, I'll give you credit every time, though. But the investment climate change is real. And I think that more people need to pay attention uh, to that. Uh, that's an undeniable and indisputable fact. Uh, we're talking to Mayors Heron, uh, Veer, and Nachu, uh, different Alberta communities. In just a minute, back to them. I want to follow up on the, the handouts, the government subsidies right now. Wanted to let you know that we're not receiving any handouts. We're working hard for our money. And that includes partnering up with... See, I, do, I try to just roll into these things as smoothly as I can, Sam Brooks. Uh, we're really I excited. <laughs> you, you, are the, <clears throat> you are the king of the Segway lately. The, the king of the Segway. Uh, we've been talking about our uh, partnership with Local Waste for a long time. This is a heads up that actually uh, this week's edition of Trash Talk is going to be tomorrow uh, as opposed to Friday. We're off the air Friday. It's Christmas Day. We encourage you to spend time with uh, your families. Uh, I mean, what else are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> but, but a Merry Christmas to everybody. So Trash Talk coming up tomorrow. You still have time to submit your rant or your rave to talk at ryanjesperson.com. The team at Local Waste has been in the waste management game here in the province of Alberta for a quarter century, and they've been doing it going toe-to-toe, going head-to-head against those face Faceless multinational garbage giants. If you value local, if your business is all about keeping it local, why not partner with Local Waste and have them manage your waste solutions? You can call Chris or Lauren LaBoss here at 780-242-9746 or check out localwaste.ca. We're also really excited to partner with Clean Air Club. I wanted to give a shout out to a listener. I screen grabbed this on my phone yesterday. A listener by the name of Sean Guthrie posted. He said, hey, I just signed up for Clean Air Club today and I already got my first fill delivered. He says, now that's good service. He said, thanks to Jespo and is talking about it on his new show, Real Talk. So Sean, Sean's going to be breathing easier because he's got his furnace filters all set up, ready to go, delivered to his door either next day or even in his case, same day. Cleanairclub.ca is where you can sign up for this and of course do your family a favor. Breathe easier heading into 2021. We're talking to the mayors of St. Albert, Kathy Heron, Red Deer, Tara Veer, and uh, Sturgeon County, Alana Natchew, our guest here. Mayor Heron, let me throw you this one. We talked about, uh, Mayor Natchew says, w- was talking about handouts, and, and then you, you kind of you kind of double-clutched on that, Mayor, and you said, well, we're talking about subsidies. Um, subsidies are a way for a government to indicate, obviously, where it sees potential, uh, where it sees a need for uh, potentially some government intervention in markets. We've seen a lot of it in oil and gas, provincially and federally before. What programs or industries, Mayor Heron, are not receiving subsidies right now that would really boost, you think, the economy, uh, investment interest, or economic activity in St. Albert and surrounding region? What would you like to see from the provincial or federal government with regards to support? I think, um, Alana, Alana, I'm going to steal that phrase too about investing. In Wasn't that Parliament. great? It was great because I, I've been it's been very clear from the federal government that their stimulus support will be uh, green recovery. And 
and our 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 provincial government has to understand that if if they don't and if they don't step up and match some of the grants that the federal government is coming alberta will lose out and we don't want to lose out on anything so i'll give you a perfect example st albert has been um and very proudly one of the first actually the first city in all of canada to invest in electric uh, transit buses and we could do that because of uh, support from the federal government matched by the provincial otherwise the return on investment on those buses was just not going to work so uh, we were all set to go and buy five more buses this year and the provincial government stopped uh, matching the federal grant and we lost out and so we were now buy buying diesel buses and so that's a loss for Alberta and I think that's a loss for our environment and I, th I think those kind of projects is is it's about partnership between all three levels of government uh, it's a priority for Albertans in many ways to invest in green greener energy and so we have to work together with the provincial government to make them understand that that's important so we can work with the federal government because their focus is very clear it's very green so I think for me, that's where we are um, maybe falling behind a bit is of investment in um, infrastructure that will take us away from carbon. Mayor Vera, I want to ask you the same question. I mean, you, you did earlier in this conversation note a couple of really interesting uh, developments in, in the city of Red Deer and around there, uh, the transition of Red Deer College to Red Deer University and the impact that that will have. We've talked a, a lot about industry. I mean, it's just even, I mean, the Justice Center downtown, it's impossible. I, I, I hope you don't roll your eyes on this. I know you'll recognize the, I was guilty even as a Calgary kid growing up. Uh, to being, you know, I would say like, I love Red Deer. And what I was thinking of Red Deer was Gasoline Alley. I was like, I love, and then I moved there. and <laughs> You know what I mean? And I, Donut mail. And then, I, and then I moved there and I was like, oh yeah, there's a whole city of 100,000 people here that has nothing. Now, Gasoline Alley is, is a huge economic driver, obviously, but Red Deer's more than that. The expansion of Gasoline Alley has been bananas over the last few years. What else is on the horizon? And in the context of, of investment, subsidy, government support at the different levels, what would you really like to see? Well, I, I can't let it go. So Gasoline Alley is in Red Deer County. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I knew she was going to say that. <laughs> and, yeah, anybody that knows me. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it is kind of funny because, you, you know, I think P our fellow Albertans, you know, millions of Albertans travel along that QE2 stretch between Edmonton and Calgary. And I'll often get tweets from fellow Albertans, you know, about Gasoline Alley, you should do this. Why did you do this? And I'll be like, you'll have to talk to the mayor of Red Deer County about that. But you got um, one of those from the former mayor of St. Albert. On that yeah. Nolan tweeted <laughs> yes, you I, about I, the I, exit. I, I'm like, <laughs> uh, I, the former mayor of St. Albert, I said, uh, Mayor Nolan, uh, you, <laughs> you were in caucus when we talked about that. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I... Uh, I concur I, with with what my colleagues have said in terms of leveraging leveraging what uh, what the federal government uh, it, leveraging those specific grants. Uh, otherwise, Alberta will will lose out on that 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 new money uh, and new new money injection into our provincial economy. Um, I, I I won't name a specific sector. Uh, but I will, I think, address it more on a principle basis. I, I think it's important that there is some measure of equality or equity and consistency in terms of, of industries across the board. Um, I think one of the challenges uh, that, we're, that we're experiencing in our local economy is, you know, I, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a business that's not struggling financially. I, you know, I, I think that there's the few exceptions uh, just because uh, of the way the pandemic has gone, uh, but but I think the exceptions are rare, and you know I, I think some of the, the the companies that have had to write off um, tax bills, for example, is is an example of a specific industry area of industry uh, where you, you know there's been some fluctuations there. Uh, you know I I will say I think small business really need, does need to be a, a focus. Uh, but even in saying that large business, you know, I think of some of our major industries here, the amount of capital they've had to invest in the last year alone in order to be uh, COVID compliant. Oh, man. Uh, we have one, we have one uh, major uh, agri-food producer here. I, I believe they've invested about 30 million over the last year to be COVID compliant. And that's substantial for them. Oh. Um, but I, but I think talking about small business, I think is really critical. Uh, you know, I, 
I think small business, those who were living on the margins anyway, uh, just because of the ongoing, the, the deep, the protracted recession that we were in, and then, you know, the pandemic hit, uh, but also, you know, startups and the impacts that they've had there. And so we're doing what we can locally, if we're going to advocate, you know, to other orders of government, then I'll, uh, you know, we always try to do what we can uh, within our sphere of influence. Um, but certainly I think small business, uh, we cannot forget small business because they really were living on the margin to begin with. Um, and the other point I'll make is one, if there is one specific sector that I hear from, um, and again, contextualizing it, saying that every sector uh, we're hearing about their challenges is, is sort of the arts culture industry um, because a lot of uh, those individuals and organizations and companies sort of work on a contractual basis. Um, so arts, culture, entertainment, um, I think there's some nuance there uh, that we haven't talked a lot about um, and they haven't necessarily been eligible for some of the programs. But again, even in naming one, um, you know, there's all kinds of people that come to mind, um, you know, the way the pandemic has affected the vulnerable people in our community. So, you know, it sort of opens this Pandora's box. So I think consistency and principles and equity is really where I come back to and making sure that no one is left behind, whether it's individuals. Uh, small business or or large business. Well, Mayor Veer, I mean, you talk about an, an agri producer that that invests thirty million dollars to become COVID compliant, and I mean that's that's astronomical and it's incredible. And and for any business to absorb that amount of money, I don't care how big you are, uh, you're going to feel that. I mean, I was talking with a, as a matter of fact, a, a relatively uh, well, an independent brewer. Uh, in Edmonton yesterday, and uh, to our audience at home, we're going to have a very exciting uh, announcement around a beer collaboration in the new year. But that's not for right now. Um, but I was talking to these brewers you just yesterday, love the hints, and don't they, you? Uh, they, 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 uh, the brewer yesterday says to me, it wasn't them, but it was another small brewer that had a tap room. And they said to give you a sense of of what this challenge has been like. So they've had, you know, they say they have thirty employees, and they, they've got to go down to fewer than ten. Uh, because their bottom line is just hacked and slashed and they've got to close their facility. But then they're told that they can open so long as they have appropriate distance, right? So they pull out some of the tables, which is obviously is a loss of revenue. They can't have as many customers in there. And then they're told they have to put up plexiglass. So these are $400 sheets of plexiglass. I know that to be sure. The one right in here is $475 paid for it myself. I know how much it costs. $400 for a sheet of plexiglass. They put in 20 of them. So they're in for about, I don't know, eight grand or so, and then they get shut down again. So now they're on the hook for, you know, close to $10,000 worth of plexiglass, and they can't even open. For any, for any small business owner, that's a kick in the teeth. I mean, let, let's run the gamut here. Let's, let's ask all three of you. Mayor Nachu, we'll start with you. What can you do at a municipal government level to provide assistance and support for small businesses? Small businesses by far the biggest employers in Canada. Well, certainly not increasing taxes is, is first and foremost, and, and shopping local. I think we had 46 uh, businesses sign up for our Shop the Season uh, online uh, project that Dev uh, worked on this fall. And I think just consistently doing that. I think sometimes the general public, we can have a pretty short uh, memory. And I think we need to commit to supporting and buying local whenever possible. Uh, and to do that for uh, not just January, February, March, uh, and then move on, but I think commit to really, um, you know, voting with our dollars, really supporting those businesses who are the ones that uh, support local ball teams uh, and and just really care about the communities. They're they're not you know necessarily. Uh, well, they're our, they're our backbone. They're the number one employer as well. And they provide the services that we need. And I grew up in small town Saskatchewan. Uh, and it was you know drilled into me. It doesn't matter if you're going to pay more for your milk and your bread and your eggs and whatever. You're going to buy it in town. Or the only option you're going to have is to drive 40 minutes down the road and, and get it somewhere else. So, um that's that's just what we need to do. We and need I, to let me let me because I I I hundred percent agree with you on shopping local. Absolutely, I don't know anybody that will disagree. But but when you say to not raise taxes, uh, that that's a that's a, a an obvious and popular thing for a mayor to say. 
Uh, but I think right now in Alberta, especially what we've seen in the past year, and I've talked to Mayor Morishita down in Brooks and the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, we know that uh, the, the provincial government, it, as part of its mandate uh, to cut down on this deficit and, and I think to start positioning itself uh, to, to be in a bit of a more healthy position on, on a post-COVID economy is downloading a lot of cost to municipalities. And I'm talking to a <laughs> lot of mayors that are telling me they have no option but to raise taxes. I mean, unless you want to stop having police officers or unless you want to stop plowing the roads, right? I mean, are, isn't your hand forced a little bit on that, Mayor Natchew? It is to a degree, but... I would say in 2017, we kind of saw the writing on the wall, just looking at where the economy was going, even even pre-COVID. So we went through an organizational review. We, we you know, took a hard look at how we were doing things uh, and we continue to do that. So we've uh, we've taken steps and, and as Kathy can uh, attest to as well, even regionally, we're, we're trying to find efficiencies because that can save time and money. Uh, and that's what we're focusing on. Um, and and I think you just have to be sure that you're spending money in the right places. Uh, there are services that that are core services that can't be cut. But you know we're even looking at um, using technology, using drones. Like what what can we do? What's within our grasp? New technology. Uh, and, and even, you know, do we need to build bricks and mortar to fit more people in? Well, no, actually, we we were going to spend the next few years looking at how to encourage people to work from home if they could. And lo and behold, in five days uh, after COVID <laughs> hit, uh, over 85 percent of our workforce was working from home, which then, you know, uh, the, the consequence we we knew was coming was uh, horrendous broadband. So, uh, you know, we've committed $7.3 million in this year's budget because we cannot wait uh, for federal and provincial uh, funding for that. We need to be able to provide that core service and we think it is a core service to our residents so that those small businesses, and as your guest earlier was mentioning, if you've got food to sell and you can sell it online, yeah. You've got an open pipe to uh, to global customers. So, you know, that's we're we're investing in the future by investing in broadband so that the kids that need to be educated at home uh, don't have to drive to a nearby library or a nearby municipal building and and you know wait for enough Wi-Fi uh, or bandwidth to be able to you know submit their paper or write a, an exam. I mean, the the level of stress that that has put people under working from home with uh with internet that as i've said before is is um tantamount to developing a uh, country or third world country so so that's where we're putting our money and that will help small business be able to access a broader uh range of customers and be able to help our kids get a better education um and perhaps be able to have people work from home and, and find something in you know in the new economy that that works for them so so that's one way uh, and again, that's building off of investments that were made years ago by by previous mayors that that we are uh, beneficial recipients of now. But we just you don't take your foot off the gas. You have to keep pushing for growth to fund the next uh, big investment that would be needed. So so that's what we're doing. We're we're investing in broadband to help our small businesses and our kids. You know, Alana, I think that's I think that's one of the most underreported. Stories. This is on me. This is this is the fault of storytellers and, and and members of the media like myself. Probably one of the most underreported stories is the lack of of broadband or lack of reliable internet in rural communities and the onus that's been put on families. Uh, to, to you know, we we take it so for granted here. Uh, we say, oh, you just move your school online, you move your banking online, you move your e-commerce online, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And for a lot of people, that's just that's not even a, an option. Uh, and, you know, there are kids that cannot school from home in Alberta, and we need to have more of a provincial and national conversation about that. Um, Mayor, Mayor Heron, I know that like there's kind of two questions at play here. So we've said, what can municipalities, municipal governments do for small business? And how much more difficult is it to say no new taxes uh, with the trend you're seeing from the provincial government, which is passing uh, significant costs along to the municipalities? So how do you tackle that in St. Albert? Uh, first of all, I think... Um the conversation about not raising taxes is, is an interesting one and it's not and it's not just about the expense side of the ledger and i think that's what gets lost all the time i think the, there's always this pressure you need to do more with less you need to 
be more efficient. And, and I think people need to know how well run municipalities are in Alberta. They are lean machines. They really do focus on what they need to do. You know, we can have a bigger conversation about downloading and Tara could talk about ambulances and <laughs> oh, there's lots, uh, but there's the other side of the ledger is the revenue side. And I think, um, and that doesn't always have to come from taxes. So there's there's a big conversation going on municipally uh, across Alberta about um, municipally controlled corporations that are kind of arm's length em entities, much like EPCOR is in, in uh, Edmonton, that work as a, as a business that invest uh, capital dollars outside of the municipality so it doesn't affect the municipal tax load or the debt load, sorry, and uh, generates revenue and then dividends back to the municipality and keeps the taxes down. So that's revenue. And so we really need to talk about both sides of the ledger because the city of St. Albert's going through a really massive operational fiscal review right now and Ernst & Young is doing it and they they have they have some suggestions on, on you know, tweaking transit and maybe not investing as much in uh, in certain areas, regardless, that's not going to fix the sustainability solution for municipalities going forward. You cannot uh, continue as we are and expect zero percent increases for ten years because that just means you're going to you're going to forfeit the next generation's future. There'll be crumbling infrastructure ever if with zero percent. So we have to look at revenue generation, and so we're looking in Saint Albert at uh, a corporation on energy, green energy specifically. So that would be geothermal, solar panels. Uh, you know, district energy uh, waste uh, is a huge energy source for us right Mayor, now. Can I can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. <laughs> Super rude and interrupt. Can I? Because people's I'm going to be honest with you. People's eyes glaze over a little. Not not everybody, uh, but a lot of people's eyes glaze over a little bit when you say we're investing in green energy and solar and this. And, and honestly, I mean, this show is called Real Talk. Real Talk. A lot of people mm -hmm. think it's bullshit. A lot of people think that it's a joke. <laughs> a lot of people think that it, it can't work in Alberta. They think that it's a pipe dream. They think that you're ignoring. They say we still put gas in our cars. We're still you know, heating our homes with natural gas. This, this is malarkey to steal from the president elect. What's the argument for it from a bottom line standpoint? You wouldn't be wasting your time on it if it wasn't a real thing. No, exactly. So St. Albert's looking at investing $30 million in a solar farm. We have a, a piece of land that uh, we we're using to dump our snow. And so it's got lots of salt contamination. It's, it's, it's not going to be developable for a very long time. So why not put solar panels on it. We're talking about doing it in three stages because $30 million scares everyone. It scares my entire council and my, my residents. So we're talking three phases of $10 million each. I would love it if I could do that through a municipal corporation and not through the municipality. So the debt wouldn't be on me. But the, uh, the investment, it's projected will um, pay for itself. Like the, the, the energy we can sell back to the grid will not only pay for the uh, mortgage payment on the on the solar panels itself, it'll give us about another million dollars a year uh, in revenue, which is about a 1% tax increase for St. Albert. And that's just in phase one. So you build it out. And then once the debt's paid off, you have a, a huge uh, revenue generation. So why would you not investigate that? You don't jump into it without doing your due diligence, but we're not the first to do this and, and we won't be the last. So we, we look at other regions that have done it. Waste to energy is another huge one. It's, it's generating... Uh, money all over Europe. And uh, I think we have a provincial government that's actually interested in it. I went to a pilot plant that, that ATCO had built. They were throwing waste wood in and they were generating syn gas, which they just fit into the natural gas lines. And it was heating your homes last year and no one even knew. It was just a pilot, but it works. And so there's lots that we can learn from that. And as, as we said earlier, the investment from the federal government, you don't want to turn that down. Uh, Mayor Veer, uh, fr from your perspective in, in central Alberta, in Red Deer, um, I've always kind of wondered about that, by the way. We talk about Red Deer in central Alberta and Edmonton in northern Alberta. Not even close to accurate. You are in southern Alberta. We are in central Alberta. And our friends in Grand Prairie and Fort McMurray are in northern Alberta. But I digress. Uh, not a topic of conversation for today. From your perspective, <laughs> you're like, where is he going with this? The answer is nowhere. Um, from your perspective in Red like Deer, it, yeah, how, how similar is your mandate or, or in the questions that we pitched about assisting small business, keeping the mill rate as close to zero as possible, how similar? similar as Red Deer to the other two jurisdictions? I, I would say some similarities. So we, I think, have had three approaches. One was uh, our initial pandemic response. Um, we pivoted very quickly 
uh, things like, and I think most municipalities in Alberta did that, but deferred the option for property tax uh, payments, uh, you know, freezing, um, we suspended things like downtown parking charges, wherever we had an economic lever that we could exercise, we did it. Um, and, and, you know, I, I know that one of the frustrations with municipalities is that we don't necessarily always have the levers that people presume that we do. Um, but the ones that we had, we exercised those, just recognizing that we were in a new normal and we needed to pivot very quickly. So I think we've done that throughout 2020. On the go ahead, uh, I would say that there's two pretty key areas, uh, support in Mayor Alana in the, in the shop local campaign. I think that that's important for all of us to do that. Um, but, but we have frozen our property tax rates for uh, 2021 and 2022. We've frozen all of our user fees, all uh, you know things like business licenses, everything across the board. We've frozen all fees. Our utilities, I, I think, will go up, up to a maximum of 0.5 percent, and we've done that. And and we were we we needed to do that just from for us to keep our governing authority with our community. Our community is hurting. Uh, we recognize that they would not have the financial capacity either on a household or business uh, respect to be able to absorb any new cost. Uh, so we needed to do our part. Uh, and we went through a complete systemic organizational review. We used the pandemic as a catalyst to, um, and it, it, was, it was hard. Uh, we had substantial layoffs at the city. We had many voluntary retirements of longtime city staff as a way of controlling uh, city costs. Uh, and I will say without substantial uh, service reductions. I, I think there's some areas where we've had service shifts, uh, but without without service cuts, um, because we still need to provide quality services to our community. So I, I would say that that's, it's, we've, we've put our community, we've indicated to our community that that was a short term measure. Uh, the other thing is the, the money coming in on capital from federal and provincial government is substantial. So that did give us some flexibility in terms of the, our, our, what our normal debt servicing would be. Uh, that new money, I think, has helped sort of buffer against tax rate shock uh, over the next two years. But the third area that, that we've invested in is we have used some of the new tools uh, in the provincial legislation. We had some initial I guess maybe reluctance is the word with Bill 7 in Alberta. We didn't want to see a race to the bottom. I know that phrase was used at our mid-sized mayor's caucus a lot. But I will say we have used it. Uh, we've used uh, the ability to freeze uh, or to defer or freeze tax rates. We've launched some new uh, local grant programs to help uh, businesses improve their facades and to match grants. Uh, and that's investment in our local economy. We've used it. Um, to help leverage demolitions of derelict buildings. And we're starting to see some uptake on that, to see some reclamation of uh, some lands that uh, otherwise would be cost prohibitive to reclaim. So those are long-term plays. Um, but when we see, you know, a derelict building that's been sitting dormant, uh, you know, causing urban blight for the last five years, when we see those types of buildings uh, demolished because of uh, because of our ability to to look at our local uh, finances a little bit differently, um, I, I think in the long term that that benefits our community. And the final area I think we've focused on the infrastructure investment, whether it's municipal, provincial, or federal, or or, or everyone uh, partnering together. We really do use infrastructure investment strategically, using public infrastructure investment to incent the private sector. Because if we don't show confidence in our local economy, who will? And I, we're starting to see the dividends of that pay off. Uh, we recently attracted a Calgary investor, a $38 million investment in our downtown, um, you know, during one of the east, worst economic recessions we've experienced in the past four decades, uh, but attracted that because we had made public inf infrastructure investment and expressed confidence in the future of our city. Have you announced what that investment is, that $38 million? Yes. Uh, so R Red Deer has a unique opportunity. We have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to redevelop our riverfront. Um, we had an industrial prime riverfront property in the heart of our downtown um, it's a beautiful area of the community, but it was industrial. And so we've been transitioning that over time. 
uh, have done significant infrastructure investment, you know, bearing power lines, putting in, uh, putting in services, building new road accesses. And that's been uh, a project that's been about, you know, 10 years in the making. The vision, I think, started 20 years ago, uh, but uh, with former Mayor Sirkan. But it's been amazing to see the infrastructure investment of the past few years, what that's meant. So 38 million, uh, we have a, a Calgary developer who's coming uh, to Red Deer for Capstone at Riverlands. Uh, developing, uh, it's a master plan community in downtown, uh, a livable, walkable community, uh, 38 million, uh, Brad Remington Homes uh, has, it was sort of our first major purchase in that area. We have eight, the city land holdings have about 18 acres. Uh, and so the economy that will develop around uh, their $38 million investment, we, you know, we're already getting uh, interest from other uh, private sector developers who now realize that, that this is a limited opportunity in terms of yeah. their ability to, to be able to access these large uh, land, land trucks. Mayors, I want to I wanna, uh, be honest and upfront with you. We asked you for an hour of your time from 9 to 10, and I want to stick to that, and, and, unless any of you volunteer to, to stay around a little longer. But I have a ton of things I want to talk to you about. There's a lot of action right now on our YouTube comment thread about the Municipal Government Act, the MGA, and how it handcuffs municipalities. We could go there. There's a great question from Fatima about anti-maskers and, and compliance with regards to COVID uh, municipal bylaws and legislation, which I really want to get to. And then we haven't even talked about women in politics. We haven't even gone there yet. Um, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to indicate that that's not a priority. We, I do want to get to that. And we have six minutes time and here I am running my mouth. So I'm going to do my best to get to all of that. Um, the MGA is important, but quite frankly, a tiny little bit boring for the average person, but very important. There's nothing boring about talking about anti-maskers. Uh, Mayor Veer, I, I want to go right back to you and ask you, how have you been managing this in your community? Uh, the, the world is always on display by way of social media. We've seen several Alberta communities, including Red Deer, have its own issues with this. How have you managed it? It, it has been a challenge. So we've had a staged uh, masking bylaw in effect uh, since August. So August, we started with mandatory masking with transit. Uh, then in uh, later fall, we moved to mandatory in city facilities, and then we did mandatory uh, public across the board. So it's been it's been staged. I will say overall, uh, I, you know, and we always say because Red Deer, you know, over the past year, we've been very challenged. I think with a lot of protests, a lot of a lot of communities have. Um, we've had some very high profile protests. Um, but I will say on the whole, we, we don't allow the actions of a few to define uh, the character of our community. And Red Deerians as a whole have, been, have even before the various uh, stages of our masking bylaw were invoked, voluntarily compliant. Um, and there has been some enforcement, you know, our enforcement prefers to educate first, to work with our community. Uh, but obviously, and then, you know, right now, of course, social gatherings are, are prohibited and, um, you know, and enforcement do attend all protests. There has uh, been the occasional uh, fine uh, that has been has been laid, um, but generally our law enforcement, you know, they, they really have had a very challenging year with respect to protests. So they try to work with our community. Um, most people are very compliant or when enforcement raises an issue, most people then will voluntarily comply. And then if not, then they will they will find as appropriate. Um, but yeah, it, you know, I, I, I like when our community is in unity and, I, and my hope for 2021 is that we'll find our way back to unity um, and, and recognize that people have differences of opinion on issues, uh, but that we all have a responsibility to each other. And, and all of us uh, want this pandemic to end. Mm -hmm. um, and the sooner we buy in uh, to public health measures, uh, the sooner we can get back to life as we once knew it. Yeah, well said. Mayor Heron, how about you in your neck of the woods in St. Albert? Similar, uh, we have, we've had our masking bylaw uh, since early August, it was full on mandatory everywhere and into our public places. And we had zero cases in St. Albert when we brought it in. Uh, we just knew that the second wave was coming and 
And when you live in the in the Edmonton metropolitan region, there's a, that added uh, complexity of confusion across municipal boundaries. So, you know, a big chunk of my population works in Edmonton and shops in Edmonton. So it's it, when Edmonton went full mandatory, uh, it was it was a natural for St. Albert to, to probably try to align. So to avoid that confusion. And the day we did it, they actually made masks mandatory in the school systems. So, you know, there was some alignment with the province as well. I am very pleased that the province has now come out with the with the provincial wide, because if you look at the 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 their website, it's purple across the, you know, it's just, we're, we've had some high cases. Uh, you know, social media uh, and email, has essentially, I would say for the most part, has been more positive than negative in St. Albert. I have had more people thank me for the masking bylaw. Mm -hmm. uh, um, they hate it. I mean, we all hate it. But, you know, the comments are, it's simple. I'm doing this to protect my neighbors, protect my, my family. And so, uh, you know, there's days that you wake up and your Twitter feed is just vile. Um, and yesterday was up for me. Yesterday I woke up and it was about the outdoor rinks. I'm sure Tara can understand the pressure around outdoor rinks right now. It's it's crazy. There's not much you can do uh, with friends anywhere except for on a rink. And there was a lot of confusion from the province about how many people were allowed on a rink. Could they play? Could they have a stick? And so the municipalities have been... I know the city managers meet with the with the province almost weekly now, trying to figure out the rules. We got the guidelines on Friday, so now we understand what's what's allowed and what's not. You can have a stick on the ice; you just can't play a game. It's really hard to tell a fifteen-year-old kid that. Oh man, yeah, it's really difficult. But you know, so yesterday morning it was it was the tyranny of Mayor Heron, and and she, you know you know you get called a Nazi and everything. Oh, and but it's anti the... You're anti-Canadian, right? Oh, a hockey, hockey is it? Yeah. <laughs> But the nice part about it was yesterday, right after my my little tear up in the morning, I went to the St. Albert Food Bank because we, my Rotary Club annually does the hampers. And so I spent the morning uh, handing out hampers. St. Albert's handing out well over 200 food hampers this year, which is which is a lot. It's much more than we normally do. We could talk a whole uh, segment on the vulnerable population and homelessness because that's where I'm passionate about. But at the same time, so we're handing out the, uh, the the hampers and I would say there was an equal number of people dropping by the food bank to drop off toys and food mm. and so you, you you wake up to this horrific um, messaging to the mayor when the mayor really is it's the province that has brought the rules and we're just trying to enforce them and then you go and see the good in our community so yeah. I think I think people are holding up when you focus on some of the positives and there's some great stories out there and I know you've reported on some of them and and I think we just need to focus on that, focus on community, focus on family. This Christmas is going to be hard. I do a coffee with Kathy, uh, whatever, once a couple, twice a month or something. And I, I broke down on Sunday trying to talk about staying home, begging people to just follow the rules this Christmas. Cause I don't want to see the outbreaks that we saw two, three weeks after Thanksgiving. Yeah. And it's hard. I won't see my parents. And that's what brought me to tears. But at the same time, and we could get into the women in politics conversation, but that's, I'm sure men cry too, but uh, it, it makes us real. The three of us are real people with real families and it's hard and we're not, there's no motivation for any politician in this planet to, to force this on people without due cause. There's zero motivation. I don't, I don't understand why that would, there would be even a, question on that well let me let Sorry. me let me ask the three of you and, and mayor natural i'll go to you first and, and if you if you want to add in something on mass that's fine but i'll note that it is 10 o'clock and i like these are these are mayor's schedules you guys probably have meetings scheduled all through the day i want to respect your time let me ask you in closing so i talked to stephen carter the other day he's a political strategist he managed nancy's campaign in 2010 uh, allison redford's chief of staff he's been on a time the guy knows what he's talking about municipally there was the assertion that Calgary may see uh, a, a woman win that mayor's chair for the first time in the city's history. And I said to him, Do you, can you see that happening? And he said, he said, I think that Calgarians are more motivated now than ever before to elect a woman as mayor. Now, Alberta's got a, a ton of uh, women mayors, and, and three of them are right here this morning. And we're really grateful that you've joined us. Do you believe, like when you... I don't know if uh, my, my friend wants me to name her personally. I'm going to. I'll apologize to her later. Uh, she's a really remarkable person. Um, City Councilor Sarah Hamilton in Edmonton. I was having a, con a candid conversation with her off the record once. 
and I asked her, you know, with regards to, you know, being one of only two women on Edmonton's council, Bev Essling or the other, and, and what's it like? And she said, well, once you get over the original, you know, the, the initial interview requests where everybody wants to talk to you, but all they ever want to interview you about is being a woman in politics, never about your political perspectives, never about your political initiatives. They just want to ask you about being a woman in politics. And that was a, a moment for me where I, I thanked her for that. It was a perspective check. It was a reminder that it's not all about that, but sometimes having uh, proportionate representation in politics, whether we're talking about women or people of identifiable faith backgrounds or different ethnicities, it is important to see general public represented in political leadership. I'm going to keep the question vague and broad and open on purpose. When it comes to politics, Mayor Natchew, do you think you approach politics differently as a woman? Uh, what do you think women bring to politics that men maybe don't? Or do you think the question is is completely asinine and inappropriate? I, I you know, I've thought about this question and, and because the only perspective uh, I know is is my own from that. I, yeah. I don't I don't know the approach that that might come from uh, you know from some of the men I work with. I, I can just like historically at any level of government and and I think there's sometimes, uh, from the male perspective, a certain maybe level of uh, of aggression uh, or um, competition that maybe is is displayed differently uh, when when women are at the table. Um, but you know, that being said, I'm a bit of a tomboy, so so uh, I, I might approach things even uh, you know more differently than my than my uh, my peers. So. I, I I really struggle with this. You know, when I was running, I I didn't look back to see if there was anybody else that you know uh, had sat on council or or been mayor. It wasn't until I was uh, elected mayor it was pointed out that oh you're the first female mayor. Oh oh yes I, I guess I am. I just I I just don't approach things through that lens. Um, but it is it, I'd say the biggest difference is how we're treated, not necessarily our perspective, but how people react to us. Um, whether that's good, bad, or otherwise, that that I, I couldn't say, but I, I'm not, I, I can't define that I approach something different than a man, Yeah. other than in dealing uh, with, you know, brothers, uh, men in my life, I think sometimes there is more of a need to, um, to be right. And I just want to get it right. I don't know whether that's just my perspective or whether that's a male-female thing. Mayor Heron, what do you think? Uh, I'm, I appreciate the message you said earlier, Ryan, about because uh, I actually hate this conversation. Mm. I, I really honestly yeah. do. I, I, I think Which you is know, fair. I have a very, yeah, I have a very good friend, Lisa Holmes, who I think you know very well. She's a legend. Uh, yeah, Mayor of Mournville and then president of AUMA. And she was the one who encouraged me to run for AUMA, and now I sit there. And so... Uh, but she was very focused on the, on the women in, in government, well, more women running politics conversation. And, and I respect that, but we would fight over it because my problem was when I was campaigning in 2010 for my very first election, I knocked on a, a one door that I will never forget. And, and the fellow that answered it sat and talked to me. We had a great conversation. And then he finally said, well, I think I'll go for you because you're cute. Jeez. And no. And so and I'll take the vote, but no. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you got to wonder with such a push on getting more women in politics, when people go to the ballot and they have, you know, a choice of 50 women running for council and, and six are women or two are women, do they check one of the women just cuts? And that's not a good way to vote. So the second time I ran, I felt like I had a bit of a background and I was running on my own merits and I don't, I didn't feel it. But you never know that first time if you won because you're a woman or if you won because you actually deserve to sit in that chair. So that's where I struggle. Um, I don't worry about it as much anymore. I feel I've, I've got the confidence. I think women sometimes suffer from a confidence issue more than, than men do. And, uh, so the, the reason that I continue to talk to women about running is just to give them that confidence. Mayor Krause, my former uh, mayor, was the one who gave me that confidence, and I will forever be appreciative for him for that. And currently in St. Albert, we actually have a majority of women on our council, mm. and we make good decisions. Yeah, and, it, and we actually elected our first black person on council. We have a very good representation of our community in St. Albert right now. 
Mayor, That's Veer, important. you have you. It, it's almost off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure there's there's five men and four women, including yourself, on Red Deer's Council, correct? Which is, is closer to an equitable balance than what we see here in Edmonton. How do you approach this question? I appreciate Mayor Heron's uh, candid response. She hates the subject matter, and and she's not alone in this. Um, and and I, quite frankly, hesitate to have to facilitate the conversation. Uh, were it not indicated to be a priority by members of the electorate, by Albertans that are watching right now, and and, and by conversations we've had in the past, how do you approach the conversation? I, I'm of a bit of a mixed mind on it too. I think on on a broader principle basis, I really do think representation matters. I think that the, it's important. Um, I think the broader your representation, the broader your perspectives. And I've always, uh, you know, I'm in my fifth term on council, second as mayor. You know, the broader our perspectives on council, the more uh, council should be a should be a, a microcosm of our community. And I think the more diverse our perspectives, then the more rounded out our decision makings to make sure that we're governing for all. Um, and I, I do think that that's really important that we govern for all. Um, and, and so I think that that's important. I also am a product of, um, you know, I mentioned to her earlier when we were talking about our downtown revitalization. Um, when I was in grade six, I visited city hall, you know, every grade six student in Alberta visits their city hall because they learn about municipal government. And I, re I met Red Deer's first female mayor. And I, I um, decided that day I want to be a mayor um, wow. and because I saw her and I, she inspired me. And then I met her again later in um, high school and we remain good friends to this day, you know, uh, you know, be because she, I saw her in action. And so I do, I, I personally have never really approached my, uh, you know, campaigns, elections, mandates, uh, governing mandates or issues just solely on a gender basis. Uh, I, I agree with my colleagues. I always wanted people to vote for me uh, because I knew the issues. I care deeply about my community. I have a vision for the future, um, you know, and have a, a strong, strong mind and compassionate heart uh, and want to wave my community's flag and do what is right by the people I serve um, and approach uh, public, approach my mandate with an ethic of service. I, I always wanted to be the most credible candidate on the ballot. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there's people who vote one way or the other on the basis of gender, uh, but I've, I, I've never really approached it personally that way. Yeah. Having said that though, in serving an elected office, I do believe, you know, particularly because of my personal experience, I am cognizant of the fact that um, I am where I am um, because someone modeled it. And so I do try to take a lot of time to invest, particularly in kids and youth, um, and, and let them know that I, I believe in them and that they can do anything that they set their mind to, that it will not always be easy. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, I have I have encounters, uh, you know, one day there might be a book about some of the experiences as a woman in politics. Um, you know, but I, you know, I have a group of girls that I've mentored for, you know, probably about the past six or seven years. Um, and some, they sometimes read, they're in, you know, they're sort of inspired by the idea, do anything you set your mind to and buy into that message. You know, but we had a horrible issue in the community, you know, a few months ago and some of the stuff that was written about me on social media, you know, they would call in tears and I said, you know what? you cannot allow uh, other people's words to hold you back. And, and just because someone writes it on social media doesn't mean it's true. And that's all the more reason uh, that we need to fight uh, for a greater good and make, and make progress. Um, so it, yeah, it's an interesting conversation. Um, I'm a bit of mixed mind on it. I, I personally don't, don't necessarily, you know, I've never campaigned on that. But I also recognize uh, that it's important for me to be a good role model. Yeah, I mean, e easier said than done. And I, and I appreciate your, uh, I mean, that's just, that that's a really kind of a, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess noble, reasonable, measured, mature perspective on it all. Um, I, I don't know who gets more vitriol. I think probably politicians than members of the media on, uh, and, I, and I maybe include pro athletes on that list as well on social media, really can get taken through the ring. I think politicians get it the worst. And, uh, and, and, and I will say I've had mornings where I've woken up 
and checked my Twitter mentions to see what's going on in the day and someone will say something and when you read it the first thing in the morning telling you how shitty you are, uh, sometimes it's really difficult to get up and brush your teeth and shave and want to go to work. Um, but the three of you do it uh, a lot of times without the recognition that, that you might deserve or the credit for the impacts that you're making on your communities. Um, we're 12 minutes past the time that we asked you for. And so I'm just going to thank you for your time. Uh, Mayor Veer, Tara Veer out of Red Deer, Mayor Kathy Heron out of St. Albert, and Mayor Alana Natchew out of Sturgeon County, three great Albertans. And we're uh, thrilled to have you on the Real Talk roster. Uh, happy holidays and a Merry Christmas to each of you, your families, your councils, and your communities. And thank you for spending an hour with us today, more than an hour. We really appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Right. Congratulations on your show, Ryan. Thanks for having us on and stay safe, everyone. Thanks, yeah. Mayor. Really Merry appreciate Christmas that. to all your viewers. You got it. I love those three. Uh, Mayor Alana Natchew, uh, Kathy Heron, and Tara Veer. That was great. Um, we could have obviously gone for another hour and a half with those three. Um, I want to let you know that we're going to be checking in uh, with mayors across Canada. Uh, into this next year, we've got some really long-term plans, sort of 12-month plans on stories we want to cover and how we want to cover them. And we're also going to be touching down on other communities in Western Canada on a regular basis. Uh, we know that that's where we, we have... Uh, pretty exciting data that shows us where people are watching from, uh, where people are downloading podcasts from, where they're streaming live from uh, in Western Canada, across this country and outside of Canada as well. And, and that, again, uh, informs uh, some of the work that we do in trying to make sure that we uh, provide robust co and meaningful coverage into those communities. Uh, that includes the community of Banff, uh, by the way, a unique perspective on governance from Mayor Karen Sorensen, who's going to be joining us next week. Uh, we believe that that's going to be coming up. So far, it looks like the show Tuesday the 29th uh, is going to be Mayor uh, Karen Sorensen out of Banff and Dragon Arlene Dickinson, which is going to be a pretty awesome show. You're not going to want to miss that. That'll be the week uh, between uh, Christmas and then New Year's. And as we announced yesterday, uh, if you are one of our Patreon supporters and, and we value your support so much, those of you that are donating five bucks a month or more to Real Talk as part of our Patreon platform, you can learn more about that. It's right across the top bar at ryanjesperson.com. The morning of New Year's Eve, so Thursday, December 31st, it's going to be a special broadcast, uh, a private broadcast, if you will, limited to those that support us on Patreon. So if you're already a supporter, you'll be receiving your Zoom link uh, next Thursday morning, uh, probably late Wednesday night. And uh, if you're not yet a supporter, but you'd like to be part of that conversation, that broadcast, we're going to be taking questions from the audience, having a little bit of fun. Uh, Sam and I are going to be getting into the mimosas that Thursday morning. You can sign up and support us on Patreon. We value that so much. And, and our Patreon supporters are those that have allowed us to, to do small things like, like change the window coverings in here and bring in better lighting. Uh, our next investment is going to be studio cameras. So the show's going to look even better we're going to have better coverage when we can finally get we've got this big can we take camera four for a second sam you've seen this table before we've got this big table and and right now it looks pretty modest but you'll notice that there are four chairs around the table four microphones around the table this studio has been built for in-person round table conversations and we can't wait until we can open up that studio uh and of course we'll be doing that with more cameras thanks to those of you that are supporting us on patreon Speaking of support, we would be nowhere without the support of our advertisers. We call them our Real Talk Builders, and that includes Scott and his team at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Mayor Heron talks about building and expansion and industry and, and investment in St. Albert. If you haven't seen the new St. Albert Dodge, you got to swing by. They just opened it a few months ago. It's gorgeous, brand new building, absolutely massive. And they're proud to feature Alberta's best selection in partnership with Sherwood Dodge, Alberta's best selection of Jeeps. Tis the season to get into a Jeep. I know I've been talking to you a lot about those last minute gift purchases. I mean, if you're feeling really generous, if your partner, if your kid, if your mom or dad or whomever else uh, you hold dear in your life has been every day crossing their fingers, hoping that an old jalopy will start, you know that it's barely going to make it through the winter. Now's the time to upgrade them. What about a big red bow? on top of a brand new Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Grand Cherokee or any other member of that Jeep lineup, go check out the team at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. And same goes now two days away from the holidays. It's not too late to give a call to Friesen Brothers. They're in 14 Alberta communities, probably pretty close to yours, no matter where you're watching us from. And their team of Red Seal chefs are putting together Christmas feasts, taking all the work off your plate 
and putting Alberta turkey, Alberta produce, and that famous sourdough bread onto your plate. They're doing all the work at Friesen Brothers, which is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. And our thanks to them. Huge response yesterday after we read that letter, Sam, from Friesen Brothers founder and current chairman, Frank Loveson. Uh, Frank's in his 80s, but still you can see uh, the letter. I posted it on my Twitter yesterday after I read it, taking aim at the, the big billion dollar corporations that tapped into the emergency wage subsidy, the CEWS, and then paid out millions of dollars. In some cases, Imperial Oil is an example, more than $100 million to their shareholders. Huge response to that letter from Frank Loveson yesterday. Were you reading some of the comments? It was it was shared like hundreds of times yesterday. I couldn't believe it. I Yeah, I was. Uh... Uh, and and just like first of all, keep the responses coming. We love to hear from it. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I I think that like uh, Frank really, you know, it, I, part of it is just the fact that we we promote Reason Brothers and we have a little bit of a, a window to that on our show. But I think like Frank resonated with a lot of people, and I think Frank was not speaking on behalf of the owner of Friesen Brothers. Frank was speaking on the on, on behalf of all the struggling small businesses, all the people that are yeah. just sort of watching the optics of this because. It's hard. It's it's you know, and I'm I'm very firmly in the camp that we need more support for our small businesses, but you know, we're not supporting them to make the owners rich. We're supporting them to get through this hurdle. Well, and I think the principle that he was getting at mostly was that in in times that are difficult uh, economically and otherwise, uh, the government of Canada and governments at all levels, uh, which really means us. Uh, we are taking on incredible amount. Like when we take a look at a federal deficit this year uh, that's being pegged at around two hundred and sixty five billion dollars. Like to put that into perspective, you remember when Justin Trudeau ran in twenty fifteen and he promised to run a ten billion dollar deficit. Like, like in other words, he promised that it wouldn't be more than that. He didn't. He promised it would be ten billion dollars. Now it ended up being thirty billion dollars in the first year, and and it and it rose after that. But Canadians were, or some Canadians were, outraged at uh, him, at the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister at the time, Bill Morneau, and the federal Liberal government breaking its promise to run up to a ten billion dollar deficit, instead running a thirty billion dollar deficit. Now times that by a thousand times. Right. Like like there's a thousand percent increase when we're talking about now a deficit of 265, 270, maybe 300 billion dollars this year. It paints a picture of what this has been. It pushes Canada's debt load to over a trillion dollars. Now, you're going to say, well, what was the government supposed to do? The government did what it had to do. Many of you. I mean, Donovan was watching the other day. He reached out and he said, hey, without the CERB. Without that Canada Emergency Response Benefit, Donovan was talking in response to comments from from Jason Kenney, who was who was blaming overdoses on CERB. But Donovan said, without the CERB, uh, we would have had to sell our house. You know, Donovan, uh, I think you know, late forties, early fifties type thing. Like he was in a position where his industry was hit hard, and without the CERB, he would have been completely screwed. And listing his house and having to sell it to stay above water in a soft real estate market, not ideal. So this is not a shot at the government for providing emergency wage subsidies that allowed businesses to stay open or providing the the emergency response benefit that allowed people to feed their families and keep their lights on. But it paints a picture of the type of year fiscally that it's been for the government of Canada, for the people of Canada, and what the implications are moving forward. So we're all going to have to pay this back. Right. We recognize that this year, I mean, the the two grand that everybody's getting and I'm not taking a shot at it. I support it. I didn't receive it. People that needed it did receive it. Um, So I can support it whether or not I receive it. I support the program. But the fact of the matter is there will be a time to reconcile that debt. And I think that when you hear that companies are accepting millions of dollars in emergency wage benefits to keep people employed, which is good, which is important, but accepting millions of dollars on the public dime, like hundreds of millions, and then paying out tens or hundreds of millions to their shareholders, it rubs people the wrong way. And it should rub people the wrong way. Uh, it, it, Frank Loveson himself talks about ethical leadership. In other words, this is not that. You can read the letter on my Twitter profile if you like, and you, you can let me know what you think. Uh, coming up tomorrow, we've got a great show in store. It's Christmas Eve tomorrow. And uh, I want to get in one last mention before we tell you about the show. Christmas Eve tomorrow, Sam, I'm not quite ready to wrap yet. We're going to tell you tomorrow's going to be a great show because we're going to be checking in with a fella who is celebrating in his adult years his first 
ever Christmas. Wow. It's going to be a great interview. This I'm so, sounds cool. I haven't told you about this. Uh, he, he, he has a faith background outside uh, yeah. of the traditional Christian faith and his, and even culturally has not celebrated Christmas before, but because he's not with his family this year, he's getting his roommates or those around him to help him come to an understanding of what celebrating Christmas is like. He's got gifts under the tree. He's got a freaking tree in his house for the first time ever. And he's going to join us. And we're really excited for that conversation. So that's going to be coming up tomorrow as part of our Christmas Eve special. Um, uh, Sam, I haven't talked to you about this yet. Uh, that's going to be Muhammad Hussein, by the way, that's joining us tomorrow. We're also going to be talking to one of Santa's helpers tomorrow. Her name's Kara. This is an exclusive interview with one of Santa's helpers. People are wondering how on earth, like with regards to the elves and everything, how on earth do all these kids receive handwritten letters back after they've written Santa? We're going to get some insight into that process. It's going to be a very special show. Of course, shows like this, we uh, have sponsors that are joining us on the journey that without their support, we wouldn't be able to do this kind of stuff. And that includes the team at Alta Moving and Storage. And if you're, I know it seems early to talk about New Year's resolutions, but we got to be thinking about this type of thing. I know I am. What's the one thing in your life that you want to get cleaned up, sorted out, figured out, rectified in 2021? If it involves maybe getting that basement finally taken care of, if it includes downsizing or maybe upsizing your living space, maybe moving into somewhere that gives you a home office, you're going to need somewhere to get a way to get from A to B, right? These pod style moving containers are the perfect way, the most convenient way to do it. You talk to the team at Alta Moving and Storage, you, they're going to work with you and help you determine exactly what you need with regards to you know the size of the container, how long you're going to need it, whether or not you need movers to help you out. Maybe you need those eco-friendly frog boxes to pack everything in. Alta Moving and Storage is your local source for that. And then, of course, as the name would suggest, they have you covered for short and long-term storage solutions too. Go to Alta Moving and Storage. They support Real Talk. We'd love to see Real Talk audience members supporting them. You can learn more about their business under the sponsors link at ryanjesperson.com. So there you have it, Sam. We've wrapped the show on the 23rd tomorrow, Christmas Eve morning, and that'll be our last show of the broadcast week. It means we're going to have some fun conversations. We're going to leave some flex time. Again, we're going to check in right? with Santa's helper. Are you bringing eggnog? I, I'll pick some up. Yeah, that works. I feel like I should do that for you. You do so much for the show. I'll bring the eggnog. All right, sounds good. I'll bring the rum. I'll bring the uh, nutmeg to sprinkle on top, and we'll have a heck of like a fun two seconds. time. We're going to have a great morning. We'll talk to you then.